Hello everyone, today we'll be talking about Hedwig's Starling equation. In the previous lecture, we understood Starling equation where we figured out that the net flow out of the capillaries depend upon the differences between the hydrostatic pressure gradient and the oncotic pressure gradient. This pressure was highest at the arterial side of the capillary and as we moved towards the venous side, the net flow decreases and even reverses direction. Starling equation was formulated back in 1896 and by 1963, it was pretty well established in medical literature. However, even at that time, they did not have measurements of interstitial hydrostatic and oncotic pressure. Theoretically, it explained a lot of the observation noted in that period. However, as the time progressed, they figured out there were serious limitations to this model. The most important limitation was the low filtration paradox. As the time progressed, they figured out a way to measure these interstitial pressures they figured out that the amount of lymph flow was around 4 liters per day and that would suggest around net pressure gradient to be less than 1 millimeters of mercury. However, when they put these numbers in the Starling equation, the average net pressure gradient always came out to be 5 to 6 millimeters of mercury, which was much larger than expected. And if you put this average net pressure gradient, that would make your lymphatic flow at least 10 to 20 times higher. If you look at the black arrows, these are the net flow imbalance based on your Starling equation. However, when you observe, you see the red lines. These are the actual net force imbalance measured in the capillaries. And soon we'll talk about the glycocalyx model, which explains this difference. Second, no one observed fluid returning back into the capillaries. We remember that your driving pressure depends upon your difference in hydrostatic and oncotic pressure gradient. This is a graph of all the net filtration studies in different organs. Line of equality denotes where hydrostatic pressure gradient is equal to oncotic pressure gradient. So if hydrostatic is more than oncotic, there will be net outward movement of fluid. And if your hydrostatic is less than oncotic, you will have net inward movement of fluid into capillaries. And you can see that in almost all the organs, the movement is towards filtration and not towards the absorption. The exception is kidneys. However, we understood that the kidneys have very high filtration rate compared to any other organ. It's around 125 ml per minute compared to 2 ml per minute seen in other tissues. In an, another interesting experiment, they drop the capillary pressure below the oncotic pressure to see if the direction of filtration changes. The green dot shows your plasma oncotic pressure and as they drop the P capillary, their filtration rate dropped and became negative. However, this was only transient. And after a period of time, they noticed that the fluid stopped flowing back into the capillaries and started moving back out of the capillaries. So to explain this, they measured how interstitial pressure and flow changes with time when you drop the capillary pressure below the oncotic pressure. And as you drop your capillary pressure below the oncotic pressure, you do see absorption for some time. However, this changes back to slight filtration. And this happens because as your filtration drops, your interstitial oncotic pressure increase and your hydrostatic interstitial pressure decrease because less fluid is coming into the interstitium and interstitial proteins are now more concentrated. So you achieve a new steady state where you go back to the filtration mode even if you drop your peak capillary pressure lower than oncotic pressures. And to explain this change in the gradient, you have to understand Peclet number which is the ratio of velocity at which a molecule is washed by a solvent drag to its diffusive velocity. To understand it simply, a protein molecule has two forces acting on it. First is your solvent drag generated by your hydrostatic pressure versus your diffusion velocity, which is generated by diffusion gradient. Third problem was that amount of filtrate coming out of capillaries should be very high once you get below 10 cm of heart. To explain this, think about the capillary at the level of the heart. If you put in the numbers, you will figure out the pressure gradient is around 1 cm of water. And as you move towards the legs in standing position, your mean peak capillary pressures are high because your venular pressures are high. And that would increase your pressure gradient and this would result in very high rate of filtration and you should be developing lower extremity edema every time you stand up. In an interesting experiment, Adamson and colleagues increased interstitial oncotic pressure to plasma oncotic pressure. And you would expect as your oncotic pressure difference drop, your net filtration would rise. However, they found that the rise in the net filtration was only one third as predicted by Starling equation. So to explain all this, 
a new model has been made, which is your pore exit microgradient and the glycocalyx cleft model, which is simply called revised Starling model. I would suggest reading the whole article on this. The links are in description below. Glycocalyx is a layer of glycosaminoglycan and sialoglycoprotein, which covers your endothelium. And this controls your permeability of the capillaries and your reflection coefficient of proteins. If you remove the glycocalyx, you will see that your hydrostatic permeability coefficient increases and your reflection coefficient to the protein decreases. This is your electron micrograph of how it really looks like. The second part of understanding this model is understanding development of microgradient. So in the Starling equation, your oncotic pressure gradient is between capillary oncotic and interstitial oncotic pressures. However, in the newer model, there is a space between these two, which is your subglycocalyx space. And the oncotic pressure difference, which governs the movement of fluid, is the difference between the oncotic pressure in the plasma and the oncotic pressure in the subglycocalyx space. Since your glycocalyx has high reflection coefficient, amount of protein in this filtrate is very low. And as this fluid low in this protein filters out of this cleft, it forms a gradient. So nearer to the pore, you have less amount of protein. And as you move further away from the pore, the amount of protein concentration increases. The shade of gray denotes concentration of proteins. And this is because your interstitium is in a gel-like state and is poorly stirred. And you can see that in this experiment done by Hugh et al, where they measured the amount of protein as you move away from the base of glycocalyx. And you can see the protein concentration increasing as you move away from it. So now we understand how the subglycocalyx space works. You would have already figured out that the oncotic pressure gradient is not really between your plasma oncotic pressure and the interstitial oncotic pressure but the oncotic pressure difference between the capillary and the subglycocalyx space. And since amount of protein is pretty low, the oncotic pressure gradient is much higher. So if you put interstitial oncotic pressure and the subglycocalyx oncotic pressure in the equation, you'll figure out that the oncotic pressure gradient is significantly higher and this increases your oncotic pressure gradient and decreases your net flow. The second question that proteins, which would be high in the interstitium, should be able to diffuse back into subglycocalyx space. And this doesn't happen because of the velocity of filtrate. And we discussed Pecklet number, which was the ratio of your solvent drag to the diffusion velocity. And this prevents your proteins in the interstitium leaking back into subglycocalyx space. So your oncotic pressure in the subglycocalyx space remains very low. Even one centimeter of water differential pressure gradient results in very high velocities of filtrate, thus preventing back diffusion of the proteins. So to summarize the modified Starling equation, the pressure gradient that drives the fluid from plasma into the interstitium is your hydrostatic pressure gradient. The glycocalyx, which is the small pore system with very high reflection coefficient, determines that your subglycocalyx space has very low oncotic pressure, and the oncotic pressure that opposes this hydrostatic pressure is the difference between oncotic pressure of plasma and the subglycocalyx space. There are other methods for transfer of protein from a capillaries to the interstitium, and this happens by your large pore system in which your proteins are transported across the cells into the interstitium. This is what controls your interstitial oncotic pressure. There are aquaporin molecules in the membrane as well, which can contribute to up to 10% of the permeability. The diffusion pressure gradient between the interstitial oncotic pressure and the subglycocalyx space is neutralized by the fast flow rate of the filtrate. So modified Starling equation has only one parameter which is different. Instead of your oncotic pressure in the interstitium, you use the oncotic pressure in the subglycocalyx space. So the oncotic pressure gradient depends mostly on your reflection coefficient and oncotic pressure in the plasma. It does not depend a lot on oncotic pressure in the interstitium. However, in a subsequent lecture, we'll see how the damage to glycocalyx changes these flow when you talk about sepsis and fluids. The modified Starling principle explains a lot of the observations and limitations that we discussed before. These include why is the limb formation much lower than what Starling equation predicts, why there is no edema formation below heart, why there is no backflow of filtrate towards the venous end, and why changes in interstitial oncotic pressure 
does not have strong effect on net filtration. In summary, the glycocalyx is a semi-peruvial membrane and not the endothelium. The effective osmotic barrier is not the whole capillary wall, but the glycocalyx layer. And the oncotic pressure gradient is the difference between the oncotic pressure in the capillaries and subglycocalyx space. And when glycocalyx is intact, the net outward movement of fluid is opposed by this oncotic pressure gradient. The effect of interstitial oncotic pressure on the net fluid exchange is minimal and there is no reabsorption in venules. The references with links are in description below. I would suggest you going through it. Thank you.